organizers, uh, uh, you know, past and present for putting together this awesome series. Uh, and I'm very excited uh, to be here today to tell you about work that I've been doing in, in my postdoc in, in Wallace Marshall's lab to understand this uh, wonderful creature, uh, the microtubule skeleton of which is, is depicted here. It's a single cell called Euplodes that walks cross surfaces. Um, so to, to sort of set the stage, I just like to begin by emphasizing that life is fundamentally cellular and across all scales of um, uh, space and time and biological organization, we can sort of re reduce most biological processes to, to things that, that cells are doing. And it's easy to get the idea um, that, you know, cells are these simple little building blocks and the easiest way to get interesting biological phenomena is to pack a bunch of them together. And, you know, I'm not going to deny that things like consciousness and animal physiology and movement are very interesting, but single cells in their own right are capable of some surprisingly sophisticated, even animal-like behaviors. So what you're seeing on the screen here, it's, it's not a worm, uh, but it, it is in fact a, uh, a ciliate, a single cell that is uh, hunting down and is now devouring a small animal called a rotifer. So these kinds of things are happening out in nature all the time, um, cells are displaying these surprisingly sophisticated behaviors. And we know that these kinds of cellular behaviors emerge from the joint action of myriad molecular components, interactions between the cells and their extracellular environment and, and physical constraints. And while we're gaining an increasingly detailed and sophisticated understanding um, of, of these components and interactions, there remains a great difficulty in sort of understanding and predicting cellular behavior, particularly at the supramolecular level. Um, and so to that end, in, in my postdoc, I've, I've been working on developing tools, approaches, and systems for abstracting quantitative models from dynamical cellular data. And the hope is that we can use this, these kinds of approaches and systems uh, to better understand and predict cellular behaviors and ultimately, of course, better understand how they emerge uh, from underlying components. And if, you know, if like me, you're interested in, in principles of cellular behavior, if you're to go out and scoop some water and take a look at the cells that you might find in there, you see uh, uh, these are a bunch of uh, eukaryotic cells, microbial eukaryotes called protists that are from old drawings and also from some field samples that I've taken. Um, you'll see this, this incredible diversity of form and, and function. Uh, and that presents, I think, uh, obviously a challenge, um, but I think uh, an opportunity as well. Um, and so here's just a tree of eukaryotes to illustrate that the vast majority of eukaryotes are these microbial eukaryotes and protists. And there's this incredible diversity of form and function and, and complexity of cellular uh, structure actually sort of defines eukaryotes. And there's often associated uh, complexity of cellular behavior that can uh, arise from this. And there is shared ancestry and that shared ancestry is reflected in many sort of shared components of cells, for example, aspects of the cytoskeleton. But I think importantly, this diversity gives us the opportunity to look and, and pick the, just the best uh, system for our, our question uh, that we have chosen in science. And, and I think Wallace Marshall's lab in particular is very good at, at picking uh, among the diversity to find the, the perfect uh, cell for the, the job. And so the star of our show today here is this cell called Euplodes, and this is how I, I first encountered them. Uh, and you can see that there's this really uncannily insect or robot-like behavior that the, the cells display as they run around in their environment. They seem to be exploring and sort of up to something. And, and I, I, the, the cell is really a, an ideal system for me for, for three main reasons. And first of all, the structure of the cell makes them very amenable to quantitative uh, characterization and analysis. Um, uh, secondly, that they, they uh, display this broad range of interesting sort of behaviors. And, and finally, that these behaviors are actually also very amenable to quantitative analysis because a lot of what the cell is doing, as you see here, is, is walking around on surfaces. So this cell is about 120 microns. And you can find them in water all over the place. And of course, the question that immediately emerges if you see something like this uh, in a sample is, is how is it that a single cell without any sort of nervous system or brain, how can it be walking around like this? And the first order answer to that is, is using, uh, in the case of the species that I've studied, most uh, 14 tiny little legs is what they use. So here you can see this Euplodes cell perched on a piece of detritus and uh, uh, it has a front and a back. And on the front, you see this fringy bit here. Uh, uh, it's uh, called a membranellar band. It's part of the structure that the cell actually uses to generate feeding currents and it engulfs prey sort of in the middle of the underside of the cell. And uh, these appendages that stick down from the cell, they're called cirri, these leg like appendages, and the cell uses them for walking. And if you were to take a cross section through the cell sort of right at the base of the cirrus, what you'd see uh, is that they're composed of uh, bundles of cilia. And so here's an electron microscopy, uh, just cross section of sort of the base of a cirrus. And you can see that there are uh, all of these uh, highly ordered uh, arranged cilia sort of that extend outward. And if you look closely, you can see that basal bodies are connected mechanically to one another by these fibers. And uh, also there are fibers that emanate from the base of the cirri into the cell. And so Euplodes is actually one of the first 
uh, or earliest uh, cells that fascinated uh, uh, microscopists uh, in the early days of protistology. Uh, and they saw these fibers emanating from the cirri. They saw these complex cellular behaviors and they, they speculated that this might be some sort of rudimentary nervous system. They thought that animals evolved from ciliates. We of course now know that th this isn't the case, but there's obviously this, this fiber structure uh, that we can now see by modern microscopy. So this is a uh, certubulin labeled cell image by confocal microscopy. And we can see these fibers are actually bundles of, of microtubules. And so as I said, you know, you watch these cells, you look at their structure, it's not hard to uh, think that they're sort of up to something uh, uh, as they walk around. And, and this is some, some recent data from students in the Center, Cellular, Center for Cellular Construction summer course. Uh, and, and what they found is, is that these cells actually do seem to respond to food. So these are just plots of velocity distributions for individual cells and individual violin plots. And then the uh, uh, distribution of the, the changes in angle along cell trajectories, so like a persistence angle. And what they found is in, in abundant food, cells tend to slow down, they walk slower, and they tend to walk in sort of straighter lines. And so they are sensing and responding to, to food in their environment, for example. Cells also uh, sense and respond to mechanical stimuli. So this, this turned out to be very important for uh, uh, cells avoiding predation. Uh, they're very mechanosensitive. And so uh, again, students in the summer course found all these examples of cell-cell collisions and cells colliding, colliding with their environment. So they are feeling mechanical stimuli, and it turns out that, that they're sort of paying attention to how they encounter mechanical stimuli. And in this case, um, we see that, that a, the cell, for example, in this video here, cells that walk and run into a cell respond differently than cells that are run into, uh, where you see this escape response from the sort of surprised cell where you don't see the similar sort of response. Okay, so they're paying attention to things in their environment, and all of this different movement, all these different patterns of movement that we see in these cells, ultimately arise from different patterns of movement of these cirri. So sort of the basic question that we have in Euplodes is how is the single cell coordinating the movement of the cirri? And so I, I decided to focus mostly while I'm very interested in uh, the broad repertoire of behavior in just the simplest thing that I see cells doing, which is walk in relatively straight lines over a cover slip. So what you're looking at now is a cell that you sort of have a focal plane that's right at the interface between the cirri and the cover slip. And you can see uh, this video is slowed down about four times from real time that this cell moves these leg-like appendages and, and is able to walk in a straight line. So I said they're very amenable to quantitative analysis for a bunch of different reasons. And here's just to show you this sort of quantitative analysis pipeline that, I, that I've, I've chosen to pursue in, in asking this, this gate coordination question. And what we can do is we can label all of the CRI A through N here. And from cell to cell, these CRI are always in the same place. So I can identify the same cirrus from cell to cell. And I can encode its walking behavior. I sort of treat it as the CRI are making these binary decisions to move or not move. And I uh, have these 14 dimensional vectors. The cell has 14 CRI, 14 legs. And so uh, at each point in time, I can uh, give this uh, vector uh, for each entry a value of zero if the cirrus is in contact with the cover slip or a one if it's moving. So there really are sort of in a coarse brain level, these two states um, that the CRI switch between either stationary or uh, moving. And I can then characterize the walking trajectory um, through a bunch of points in time as a cell walks in sort of a, a linear fashion. Here's a trajectory below. And I can ask, okay, what are, what are the CRI doing? And a first uh, guess for how uh, the gate might, might appear is, is that maybe Euplodes, it, it looks kind of like an insect, maybe it walks sort of like an animal. And gate patterns in animals in general tend to have this highly deterministic character. So this is just some examples of different gates from flies. In black, uh, the leg is in contact with the surface and not moving in white, this, the leg is moving. And you can see there are these well-defined phase relationships between the limbs and they have these very deterministic patterns. And you might think, okay, it's a cell. There's no reason for it to walk at all like an animal. It doesn't have a nervous system after all. But it turns out that in many cells, we also see these similar sort of deterministic patterns uh, and well-defined phase relationships between limbs or, or appendages rather as the cells swim around. So this is this nice figure from, from Kirsty Wan showing different gait patterns in different flagellate cells. But if we look at the gait patterns of Euplodes, so in, in the rows here, we have each cirrus and time goes from left to right. Black corresponds to zero in one of these vectors and white corresponds to one. We see that the gate patterns are obviously quite complicated. Um, but if you squint at this and if you look at enough of these trajectories, you might think, okay, there is some sort of pattern here. And indeed we can perform uh, dimensionality reduction and clustering and identify these sort of gate states. So I'm not gonna go into the, all the details of how, how we did this. Um, I can say that the, the, the details of the parameters that we, we use in this coarse graining um, do not sensitively affect all the downstream results. But uh, briefly, we perform non-negative matrix factorization, which is a bit similar in spirit to principal components analysis that may be more familiar to people. 
And so we have this uh, uh, NMF basis, uh, uh, and uh, we, we uh, have these the different colors of these points correspond to different uh, clusters that we've identified by an algorithm called dbscan. And so each point in this plot corresponds to a particular pattern of serial activity, and we're grouping uh, similar patterns of, of serial activity into these gate states. So here's a represent representation of these 32 gate states that we identify. And for example, in gate state one, there's no serial activity associated with this. And if you look at other gate states, there are these different patterns of serial activity. And what allows us to, to make, do this sort of course graining in a somewhat principled way is that there is shared mutual information between the different CRI. And so because of those kinds of, of correlations and activity, um, we're able to so, sort of uh, uh, coarse grain uh, and, and find this lower dimensional representation of the gate. What we can then do is look at the uh, dynamics of gate state transitions. And I know this is a super information dense plot, but what we have here is 32 gate states represented by the nodes on this graph. The size of the node represents how much time the cell is spending in that particular gate state, with that particular pattern of, of, of serial activity. If we look over many trajectories of walking cells, the, the, the edges, these arrows, represent the, uh, uh, the gate state transitions. So larger arrows means that there are more frequent transitions from one state to the other. And the colors uh, represent, uh, it's a heat map of, of the uh, amount of cell movement associated with gate state transitions, where warmer colors correspond to more cell movement. And I know this is a very abstract sort of picture of a gate. Um, so to sort of ground you with a bit more intuition, we can consider uh, a horse walking. And it turns out that in the walking gate of a horse, there are these eight different configurations of, of limb activity. And if we were to make a similar sort of representation of the horse gate, we'd find that there are these eight gate states and there are these deterministic transitions. It's always uh, transitioning from this particular pattern of gate, or of gate states. Uh, as the horse walks across the surface. And obviously Euclides is, is much more complicated than that, um, but there is structure to the gate state transitions. There are some of the gate state transitions that happen much more often than others. And furthermore, we can appeal to this idea from physics, the concept of, of detailed balance. So in, in equilibrium systems, a condition of equilibrium is, is, is that detailed balance is satisfied. And so transitions uh, must be balanced. Uh, the forward and reverse transitions between states must be balanced. We can have no net flow uh, 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 or flux of transitions anywhere in, in state space. And so we can identify uh, gate states uh, in, in uh, and gate state transitions where we see uh, significantly broken detail balance uh, in our, our Euplodes uh, uh, gate state transition map. And what we see is there are relatively few of these gate state transitions that break detail balance, although they happen to be sometimes the most frequent transitions. And uh, we see a bunch of these uh, balanced transitions as well. And interestingly, a lot of the cell movement is actually associated with these balanced transitions. But the important thing here is just that broken detail balance in our case um, gives us a directedness to the gate. So there is a direction of time in the gate. Um, we break time uh, uh, symmetry. And, and so, so uh, this is all to say that there is, while it's complicated, there is structure to this sort of stochastic gate of Euplodes. And we were really interested in sort of the sequential logic of the gate of Euplodes. And so now we're focusing here on transition uh, probability. So the arrows are scaled by the transition probability conditioned on being in a particular state. These are the, these nodes and numbers, again, correspond to the, the gate states. Uh, and, and the colors here uh, just give you an idea of whether in blue, the state is a source and a recipient of unbalanced transitions. And in red, it's just a source or just a recipient. And if we look at transition probabilities, what we see is that there's this large group of gate states that are uh, visited by only these balanced and relatively low frequency, relatively low probability transitions. This happens to be where most of the cell uh, movement is happening, but there is sort of a, a sequential logic um, to, to this stochastic gate. And, and so again, this is an abstract representation. It may help to ground us in a specific uh, uh, example of uh, uh, one short trajectory of a cell walking. So I've marked here this uh, gate state one in gray. And that's when there are no CRI moving. This happens to be the, the most commonly occupied state in the gates of walking cells, interestingly enough. I'm just marking the occurrence of, of this uh, uh, gate state. And you can see in between any given instance or any two instances of this resting state, we have a lot of variability in the patterns of serial activity. But in these intervening uh, gate state transitions, we do see, you know, these are the, now the uh, uh, transitions which are unbalanced, so they break detail balance. So there's this, there's this cyclic character to the gate. It is stochastic, but there are these directed cycles in, in gate state space. Although, uh, 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 of course, there's a lot of variability in any given uh, the sequential set of, of gate state transitions. Okay, so we say this that Euplodes walks with a cyclic stochastic gate that's very different in character from uh, a lot of the best studied uh, gates uh, 
of, of cells and of animals. And so you might wonder why a cell would be walking in this sort of fashion. Um, you know, it's dangerous to speculate too much, but I like the idea that there's, there's something that may allow for robust locomotion in complex environments. Euplodes can't see where it's going. And so there may be something about this, this stepping pattern that the cells utilize um, to help them uh, uh, walk uh, sort of unencumbered by the, the details of the substrate, which is something that we sort of observe in culture. It's impressive that they're not slowed down more. Um, and we can also address this question uh, by using a, a very simple sort of toy model. So this question of why this particular pattern of gate state transitions. And so this is, uh, we, we, uh, I want to acknowledge first that Wallace actually wrote the initial code for these simulations. Uh, I was very impressed by this. Um, but we have a two-dimensional system that's, that's presented here uh, in, in a, an axis that doesn't actually exist here, but, but basically the cells we can uh, uh, simulate a cell as having the CRI that are in the positions that we actually observe in, in cells. And we can have two states for the CRI, either moving and generating force that will propel the cell in its direction of orientation. And if a cirrus is in contact with uh, uh, the surface, uh, uh, then it acts sort of like a spring resisting that movement. We can balance uh, forces and, and torques to give us the displacements and, and changes in orientation of a cell. And we can feed in actual patterns of, of stepping um, of, of, of walking cells and um, we can calibrate this model and, and semi-quantitatively reproduce sort of the mo overall motility patterns of cells that we see, but we can then uh, go and ask what happens when we change the patterns of serial activity. So if we take actual patterns of serial activity, we see that cells walk in relatively straight lines, but if we shuffle the order, so now uh, uh, we've just taken the same gate gates uh, uh, in, in, in any given walking trajectory, we've shuffled the order, they satisfy detailed balance. Now, the sequential order seems to be important for uh, cells walking properly in a straight line. So the cells are not able to walk as, uh, or we predict that they wouldn't be able to walk as in, in a straight a fashion if we have a shuffled order of gate state transitions. And if we have random patterns of serial activity that have the same overall average serial activity, those cells are predicted to walk straight. Although if we look at the speeds, the random patterns of, of serial activity uh, uh, tend to sort of decrease uh, uh, the, the predicted cell speed. So this at least suggests that the, the sequential logic that we've observed may be important for cells to properly walk uh, at a, a relatively high speed in a relatively straight line. Okay, but then the question of course is how is this all controlled? <laughs> and so we uh, uh, appeal to this old idea of, of the neuromotor apparatus. There's an obvious cell structure that's associated with these moving appendages, and this is a, a, a reconstruction of that uh, neuromotor apparatus, this fiber uh, or microtubule bundle system that we see associated with the CRI. So this is a confocal reconstruction of sirtubulin labeled cell, um, and the different colors, they're both, they're both these bundles of microtubules, but I've just uh, morphologically noticed that there are these morphologically distinct uh, fibers in magenta, there are thinner fibers, in cyan there are these thicker fibers that we see and uh, these labels here correspond to just the base of all the cirri. And we look at this network and what we also notice is there are these intersections, apparent intersections between the fibers. And we hoped maybe that these uh, fiber fiber intersections would uh, uh, correspond to the shared mutual information that we saw in, in some of the cirri. That turns out to not straightforwardly be the case. So it's not the topology of this network alone uh, uh, that sort of dictates the patterns of, of, of uh, serial activation, but uh, what we do see is uh, uh, that there is a sort of uh, structure within the system. So near that does uh, predict shared mutual information. So nearby CRI that have similar kinds of fibers that intersect with similar portions of the distal part of the fiber of the, of the cell cortex, um, those tend to share the most mutual information. So that gave us hope that maybe this, this structure may be involved in gate coordination. And uh, excitingly, um, we, we uh, introduced microtubule inhibiting drugs and we found that these drugs actually lead to motility defects. So what you're seeing is just in different colors, different cell trajectories, the little white dots are cells walking around on a cover slip. And under nicotinol treatment, so this is an inhibitor of microtubule polymerization, the cells seem to have trouble walking in a straight line. Um, so they walk along these circular and curving trajectories. And if we treat cells with, with taxol or paclitaxel, um, we see that this drug actually is a microtubule stabilizer and it seems to have almost the opposite effect of nicotazole where the cells walk in sort of straighter trajectories. Um, and of course we can quantify this effect. We see a dose dependence on nicotazole and that a uh, taxol has a different, uh, has the sort of opposite effect of nicotazole in terms of the uh, uh, convolution of the path. So this is just a, a, a quantification of the uh, uh, differences that we see. And importantly, we also see a visible effect on the fiber system. Um, 
if we treat cells with nicotazole in this case, we see that a lot of those magenta fibers go away. So the thin fibers are not no longer visible in these cells. We also notice that the fibers are shorter compared to the overall length of the cell. So there seems to be this visible disruption in the fiber system. And we can then go on and uh, uh, apply the same analysis pipeline that we did in untreated cells to get an understanding of the sequential logic. And what we see when we apply this to cells with these disrupted fibers, so nicotazole treated cells, we see a disruption in the sequential logic of the, the gate state transitions. So uh, uh, there's, I know a lot of information in this, but the important takeaway here is just that we have very, we have mostly similar gate states that are uh, visited even when cells have disrupted fibers, but the character of the transitions uh, uh, is, is changed quite significantly in comparison to these not disrupted fibers and consistent with our predictions of the model. If you perturb the sequential logic of, of the gates, cells shouldn't walk as, in as straight lines. And this is indeed what we see when we uh, disrupt the fiber system of walking cells. So this at least suggests uh, we don't know exactly how, but that this fiber system is involved in, in, in coordinating the gate in some way. Um, and I'll, I'll give you one little uh, additional detail, which is that if uh, uh, we look at uh, this mutual information between CRI, so looking at, uh, at the, the details of the dynamics of, this, of the CRI with respect to one another, we see more synchronous activity under drug treatment. Um, although the gate is uncoordinated or less coordinated, we see more synchronous activity of the CRI, we think that this fiber system might be involved somehow in mechanically mediating gate coordination, perhaps a bit reminiscent of some of the principles we saw in the last talk. Um, and, and so we think there may be feedback at the level of the individual CRIS that somehow uh, uh, is, is uh, uh, read out uh, in some way by the, 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 the fiber system of the cell and sort of reminiscent of this increased synchrony, increased serial activity, but uh, decreased gate coordination um, that we see under drug treatment, if we remove cells from contact with a substrate, we also tend to see a more sort of synchronous movement of the cell. So we think there may be some sort of substrate feedback that mediates proper gate coordination. All right, so uh, to summarize, we have the cell that walks with a sti sti cyclic stochastic gate, um, and we have a lot of uh, open questions now. So I think we have sort of a, a, a basic understanding of what's going on, but there's a lot more that we can learn about how this particular gate or these particular gate patterns lead to walking, um, why we're seeing the particular states and transitions that we do. I'd be very interested uh, to learn more about the mechanics of the gate in general. Um, of course, we have you know, a, a bit of insight into uh, the differential control of these CRI, but I think there's a lot more to learn at a mechanistic level of, of how the individual CRI are you know, making a decision to move or not move. Um, and there's a lot more mechanistic detail we can investigate there. And something that's perhaps most interesting to me is this, this question of the overall behavioral repertoire of the cell. And can we map these uh, gate states and gate state transitions onto uh, broader patterns of, of movement of cells that we see in different kinds of environmental conditions or perhaps compare um, different sorts of species. And uh, to that end, uh, there's been some uh, awesome recent work in the physiology course, in this case by Krishna Srinivas, who is looking at overall patterns of motility in cells. So this is just a plot of uh, uh, cell velocity uh, and, and the sort of the relative fraction of, of a given trajectory where the cells uh, spend at that speed. Um, and he's looked at two different species and we see some dynamics that are uh, interestingly reminiscent of uh, 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 movement patterns that are, are seen in, in flagellate cells. So a very different kind of cell where there may be some similar uh, uh, principles to the, the sort of uh, 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 states, motility states that these cells uh, switch between. And perhaps there are patterns in the dynamics of the, the state transitions at that level as well. This remains to be seen. Additionally, in other species of euplodes, we have uh, different morphs. So we have the same, uh, so these cells are all genetically identical, all from a single founding cell. But you can see this super giant cell takes on very different movement patterns and actually uh, they, they can become cannibalistic and they eat their sisters. Um, and the different movement patterns that we see in those cells are at least part, uh, in part due to the fact that these cells have many more CRI and much bigger CRI. So they have about twice as many CRI as the non-giant cells. And uh, Krishna was able to actually uh, look at the movement patterns of those cells and show that they, they, uh, the supergiants have these, these very different motility patterns compared to non-supergiant cells. So I, I think uh, ultimately for me, uh, uh, you know, I'm interested and I started with this idea of principles of cellular behavior and uh, if we're to really get at those, then I think there's a lot of comparative work that must be done. And so I'm very interested in, in looking uh, across the diversity of euplodes where the phylogeny is well resolved 
and we know when different cirri are gained and lost over evolutionary time. And so it's interesting to think about uh, the relationship between uh, cell structure and cell movement and, and regulation of cell movement uh, across evolutionary time scales. Uh, there are many other ciliates that walk and are very interested in understanding uh, gait patterns in other ciliates. And furthermore, there are many other cells that exhibit all sorts of very interesting kinds of behaviors. And so I've been uh, uh, trying to sort of apply these approaches that I've developed in Euplodes um, to things like hunting amoeba as well, um, uh, which in some cases actually walk around also across cover slips uh, as they move and, and hunt for prey. So with that, I would like to thank you all for your time and attention. Uh, thank wonderful collaborators and, and uh, uh, all sorts of wonderful lab mates and, and, and Wallace in, in the Marshall Lab, uh, and also students uh, from this 2021 uh, summer course in the Center for Cellular Construction and also in the physiology course um, for, for pushing forward some more Euplodes research. Thanks. Oh, and very, very exciting talk. So let me, uh, let me start uh, this. So when I uh, listen to a talk, I'm thinking whether one can just formulate this uh, as an engineering problem. So you say there is a state space, right? Uh -huh. There are certain yeah. regions you need to explore. Yes. And you only see a few of them transitions, yes. now, you know, uh, while the detail values. So doesn't mean, you know, you can see, okay, here, do we have a minimal set of uh, states uh, mm -hmm. transition we have to control in order for the system to able to explore uh, those space. Yes, and and I, I, I think that's um, very much consistent with the, the sort of picture that I have. So I we were surprised to find that um, those uh, few state transitions that violate detailed balance, that those weren't actually associated with the most cell movement. And I do really like this idea that they're somehow pushing the cell into the proper region of state space or setting up uh, the subsequent tradition uh, transitions rather, where the details of the particular steps the cell uh, takes at that point don't really matter so much uh, that it sort of wound itself up into this, this right uh, uh, sort of configuration within state space to then undergo these uh, fluctuations that turn out to be productive for the overall movement of the cell. So yeah, I, I, do, I do like the idea that they're, they're somehow uh, related to, to sort of control um, of the overall process. And I do suspect that if we are to look in, uh, this is very wildly speculative, but maybe look across other systems and apply similar approaches, that finding those uh, instances of broken detail balance might give us uh, uh, some insight that would otherwise be hard to come to uh, in terms of uh, particular dynamics that are very important for the overall control of the uh, sort of directed function of the system, as the case may be. Okay, Rafael has another question related to this kind of uh, engineering uh, uh, control idea. What yeah. are Euplos optimizing when they move? Yeah. Are they energy efficient compared to other cells or microscopic organisms? For example, yeah. humans optimize energetic costs when they work. What uh, when they work? So, what about Euplos? Yeah, yeah. So, so this is this is a great question, and I, I will say that I am I'm always very wary of optimization. Uh, so it's sort of framing of, of these, you know, biological functions as sort of a solution to an optimization problem, um, particularly with eukaryotic cells, maybe bacteria, you have many more cases where something, a function is truly, you know, optimized at some biophysical limit. Um, and so the answer is, I don't know what they're optimizing. I don't know if they're optimizing anything. But uh, the idea that I like is, is perhaps uh, that this gate uh, could be good for robust navigation. If, if, you know, as I said, the cell is not able to uh, see what sort of surface it's about to walk over. And perhaps there's something about this uh, strange stochastic gate that we see that, that allows cells to um, uh, uh, continue to move in, in a directed fashion, even as the substrate changes. And of course, there are lots of experiments that we can imagine to sort of test this idea. I think simulations can also help uh, in testing this. But I, I don't know uh, what they're optimizing, if they're optimizing anything. We can also imagine a situation where, you know, the cell has this very asymmetric structure. And in a lot of the organisms where we see these uh, deterministic gait patterns, um, we see uh, uh, that there's symmetry to the organism itself. So it's possible that, that uh, this is just the kind of gait that you get uh, from an asymmetric system that, that walks. Um, so there may not be any, anything optimized. It may just be that, you know, there's a physical constraint that could sort of explain what's going on. Um, so that was a sort of long convoluted answer to your question. And the real answer is, I don't know what's being optimized. Uh, it's an interesting thing to consider. And I think simulations and experiments could help us get towards that answer, but I don't know. Okay. 